King of Podcasts proudly presents The Broadcasters Podcast, a weekly media commentary talking about traditional and digital media headlines and talking to the content creators out front and behind the scenes. Here is the King of Podcasts. Here we are, episode 132 of the Broadcasters Podcast, King of Podcasts here with you. A lot of things to get into tonight. I have a brand new feature interview, which I'll have very shortly here on the program. Let me go and tell you who it is. It is best-selling author, activist, and actor Donnie O'Malley. He's the founder of Irreverent Warriors and also the founder of Veteran Entertainment Television, or you can just call it Vet TV. We'll tell you all about that. Really, the interview with Donnie is, is it's an eye-opening interview. How you can open your eyes when you're listening to an interview, it will open your eyes. You'll, I was certainly opened up to the real truth when it comes to veterans and, you know, veterans' life. You know, for those that have served in the military and our perceptions of them and how the veterans look at it the other way around and how we really don't understand what's going on with what those that serve in the military, what they go through and we just don't have a real grasp of what's going on and that the programming and the content that Donnie puts together really serves the military with something that really relates and they can attach themselves to more than any portrayal of military that we've ever seen on television or in the movies because according to Donnie there's not a proper representation there really isn't out there that really does what we think it is obviously when we watch you know content we see what we've seen but it doesn't even come close to what real military life is like and that's what i learned from the interview so i'm gonna let you go and hear that it's a two-part interview have about 32 minutes to go ahead and play for you a little bit later on but a lot of things going on because there's a lot of media on the move got all that to bring out to you first so first off the movies let's talk about that because that's what's really making the biggest move and it's unfortunate. I knew it was going to happen. Well, I didn't knew it was going to happen, but I'm just saying I figured it was going to because, well, if you know on this program, I've been dabbling into investments and in stock market stuff, swing trading, if you will, since the pandemic started. After I got done recording a boatload of interviews, which, I, by the way, after this Donnie O'Malley interview, I have one more interview left out of a crop of interviews that I did over the course of a couple of weeks I think I did, what, seven interviews that I've run over the last three or four months here on the program, which has been great. And I just, I wanted to go and do that, and I just had the time. And that was before I had other things that I was waiting to get done because there was only so much I felt like I could do, especially on the weekends. It was just not much to do anyway. But I did this, and I'm going to set up some more interviews coming up down the line, but um, I really enjoyed what I, I got out of all these interviews, all the ones that I've done so far. Uh, when it came to some really great guests. I mean, you know, I just had Rachel Ann Mullins. We brought up last week, Sal Pogliaris, which actually that was a recording I did beforehand that I just happened to put together. Then it was Kevin Goatee, Dave Pratt. Of course, I did a three-part with Dave Pratt, the morning mayor. Jared Easley with the podcast. When I also talked about him, talked with him initially when I first started doing all these new interviews and all, you might remember. And I was rolling through interviews, man. That was so much preparation, so much. But it was really, I really enjoyed myself doing all those interviews. It was really, really fun. Also, Kristen Pope. I'm not going to make mention of her great stuff as we were getting into the pandemic. A lot of great interviews, which I am looking forward to go ahead and start putting out the full-length interviews on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash jbrasco951. If you want to catch a lot of the many of the interviews I've done at the Broadcasters Podcast, they are on that channel. I have it in a playlist there under Broadcasters Podcast, which includes all the episodes you hear here. You can have it on the YouTube feed for you to go and check out for yourself, subscribe to it, and all the full-length interviews I included as a bonus. After the interviews have aired, I'm going to put all these out for all of you to go and check out for yourselves. So I'll have that available for all of you to go and check out very soon. Just like uh, just wanting to go and make time for it because of all the YouTube content I've been putting out there, I wanted to make sure that uh, I had so much content to work on. But I am opening up time. I want to go and make sure that I have interviews to put out to you. So there's commercial free, no commercials, no stopping. No, you, you not even have to worry about me and my diatribes going to the news. You get it 
uninterrupted. Isn't that great? Look how nice I am about this. So anyway, into the stories, we start off. First, the movies that are actually going to be not opening up, which is unfortunate. Deadline comes out, first of all, out of the couple of stories I have. Number one, Tenant, the feature film that was going to come out August 14th, I think it was, has now been moved indefinitely. There is no release date that has been announced. Mulan is also looking to going to be moved, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But a number of the tentpole movies right now for 2021, which were already set in place for September through the holidays, we're starting to see them move. With all these moves, you got to ask yourself, are the theaters going to be coming back within August as the plan? But, of course, with all the rolling back of regulations, rolling back of closures for movie theaters and other places because of the pandemic, because of ongoing cases in select markets, then the movie theaters have felt the need. And the thing is, is also you're talking about markets that are very important to the to the country. Because you're talking about California, New York, Florida, Texas, major states, California, New York, media meccas. You have to hope that those two areas come back and they're able to get things started with uh, with getting you know movies put together, television put together, and other things. And also the ex- exhibition for all these movies. To have screenings, to have, you know... The, the chances for people to go and catch the red carpets of these movies if they're not being allowed or, you know, whatever there might be, the uh, the press rows or the junkets, all those things, they're not going to happen now or they're going to be done virtually. But hopefully we're going to get some of those things back on board and we're going to start getting ourselves back into the movies again. But again, if all these movies are moving back, I don't feel so bad about this because... The movie theaters, the exhibitors want to make sure that the movie theaters are going to be fully open, at the least for those that want to come back and watch the movies. So all the theaters took a hit in terms of stock. But, of course, when they all decided to go ahead and move and push back, they're all able to go ahead and withstand a few more months, or actually until until next year. But, of course, they don't want to go and be able to be stuck with having to go and pay off the debt and the equity they've had to go and put back into their their businesses because of what's going on. Like I've been following AMC theaters for a long time, Regal, Cinemark, all the same. They're all pushing back to August. Now I have not announced an official date or weekend. They're going to put up in August, but that'll be coming up. The latest was July 31st, but here's what we got right now. The latest news. Now AMC is going to be reopening. They say mid to late August. So at the moment, Labor Day weekend, Paramount's A Quiet Place will now be leaving Labor Day weekend for April 23rd, 2021. Top Gun Maverick is now moving from December 23rd to July 2nd, 2021. The fact that Top Gun will be in the summertime is not a bad thing. I I can appreciate that. There's other movies that are going to be put out here. Let's talk about that as well. The other movies that are moving out right now, Spider-Man Far From Home, the sequel, will now be moving to Christmas time, 2021. Avatar 2 has been pushed back as well. So Avatar 2 is now moving from December 17th, 2021 to December 16th, 2022. Then there's Mulan, the Disney feature which will no longer be August 21st and it's unsetting the movie Disney for the time being. So there is no set release date for Mulan. So Disney right now is not waiting to see where Warner Brothers places Tenet next, but they also don't want to have to keep rescheduling movies until things are certain that things will be up and running again. Disney's also not revealing its playbook, according to Deadline.com, whether Mulan will debut abroad first before domestic, even though logic would dictate that. Other movies making moves. So the Avatar movies are all getting pushed back a year. They'll all be around Christmas time when they release, but they will all be pushed back a year. The Star Wars trilogy. Now, the newest film that comes up in the new trilogy, which will be under Taika Waititi's guidance, will move from December 2022 
to December 2023. And then the other one set for 2024 and 2026 will mo- now move a year ahead to 2025 and 2027. Other movies coming up. 20th Century Studios New Mutants is still scheduled for August 28th. The Personal History of David Copperfield will be limited release August 28th. The King's Man, the sequel to The Kingsman and the Kingsman, the Inner Circle, whatever it was called. The prequel, The King's Man, is September 18th. Death on the Nile, October 23rd. Black Widow, first weekend of November. Deep Water, November 13th. Pixar Soul, November 20th, The Empty Man, December 4th, Free Guy, December 11th, West Side Story, December 18th. So we're all waited right now. I don't know what's going to happen, but if I look at the, the recent look in the movies right now and what's coming up, a lot of changes have happened right away. Not much we could do about all that. It's just those are the breaks we have to go through. Because obviously the movie theaters are all set. They have made all the changes they need to make. And they have made all the preparations needed to get themselves going forward. For right now, as far as I know, Unhinged is still set for July 31st. I don't know if it's going to keep happening or not. Or if it's being moved. At the moment, I have not seen a thing that says otherwise. Well, the latest story about Unhinged, it's not looking at August, but they have not moved the date yet. They have not scheduled a definite date. But now with Mulan moving off and other movies moving off, Unhinged still feels like that's going to be the first movie that comes back, regardless of anything else. When you look at the rest of it, a lot of limited movies coming out July 31st. And August, everything is limited. All the way up to August 21st with Antebellum being the first wide release movie that will be available for theaters. So people might think that August 21st might be the earliest date possible. And some movies might make their way there if they think they can get an audience because they'll be a standalone movie towards older movies or movies that had come out prior to the pandemic. But other than that, there are no movies right now set really until September. Because then after that, Bill and Ted Face the Music will be the next movie. But that's a limited release there on September 1st. But they could do something with that. And again, we can see September is full of limited releases, a couple of wide releases right now. But it will be where people really feel like September is going to be where things will finally start We'll finally hopefully be in a spot where we can get going. I mean, look, there are certain events that are already happening right now in the world of sports, as a matter of fact. We're already seeing baseball has finally started. The NBA has finally started. They're all they're all working in very, you know, unusual circumstances. Baseball is playing in open stadiums with no fans, empty stadiums. MLS, Major League Soccer, also playing in empty stadiums. And the NBA is playing in a bubble in Orlando at the wide world of sports. So that's where we are. It's a very interesting situation. But that's where we are with all of that. Now, as for the movie theaters, what are going to happen to those? Well, let's talk about the actual movie theaters themselves. AMC Theaters, first of all, I just mentioned that they're going to be pushing back until mid or late August at the latest. So they're going to postpone domestic cinemas and the new timing currently expects release dates. As we see, movies have already started moving around, but they waited for AMC theaters, the biggest exhibitor, to make their changes first. So they were going to have originally the majority of their locations open July 15th would have already opened up. Plus another 150 locations by this weekend, but all that changed because of what happened. Cinemark and Regal Cinemas have also followed suit. All the movie theaters are going to stay closed, at least for another month. 
And so if you're looking to invest, I'd still wait because at the moment I decided to go ahead and jump out of the AMC stock for right now because I didn't want to go and stay in there while I stayed low. So I lost a bit of money. And even in trading today, I look at it's barely staying above $4 a share. But again, the theaters will make their way back. Because I think that's going to be one of the first crowd-based things. I mean, people are already going to church now. People are actually able to go and go to church services now. The movie theaters is the next step. You know, it's I think it's the safest step you can make after you know, before concerts and before sporting events. I think people won't feel too concerned if they decide to go ahead and social distance and go to the movie theaters with the parameters in place. I, I actually got from Regal Cinema, they talked about what they're going to be doing. So you're not going to be going up to the counters to get your food. They're going to expect you to go and go contactless. So you'll order it from the app and then they will call you when your food is ready so you can go ahead and pick it up. So it's not going to be you waiting at the counter, making your order, and then picking it up. It's going to be where they already have set in place what Adam Theaters initially started with, where you go ahead and pick up your food and pick up your concessions, you know, at a side counter. Now it's every counter is going to do that. So they're going to have it set for you to pick up and you take. Okay. And as for the theaters, I already know that the movie theaters are going to have a particular, you know, defogging type system that's going to be going to be put together. And I have read a little bit about what they were going to be using for the movie theaters. So this has been decreasing theater capacity is going to be planned. Plus cleanings in between showings. So let me make mention again. Cinemark actually showed a video of how their theaters are going to be cleaned up. So it's very interesting. You're going to see basically like this little spray that's off a machine. It looks like a like an exterminator's device. It's a defogger, basically. So you're going to have a machine that will absolutely clean everything up. So there's a particular disinfectant. They just take a spray, and they have it on a, on a hose, and you just have a machine, and you go across... And it takes care of everything. You just go across the seats and you spray through. And it's a quick, dry cleanup, which is really cool. And I'm looking at it. It really does look fantastic. Now, Associated Press also reports that the movie theaters are employing the studios to please release the blockbusters. Because most importantly, for the theaters to get themselves going, they have to have the theaters come back with real movies to go ahead and play. But with all these movies being moved around, it's going to be tough. No doubt about it. So reading from the Associated Press. Movie houses say that despite far from ideal circumstances, it's time for new movies. A $50 billion annual business is brought to its knees. So restaurants still have takeouts. Airlines are able to continue to uh, operate with mask flyers. The theaters have not punched a single ticket since the end of March. Now, there are some that are actually selling popcorn curbside. I haven't seen that yet. I need to go take a look at that myself. So the National Association of Theater Owners, John Fithian, says, Problem is, we need their movies. Distributors who want to play movies theatrically, they can't wait until 100% of markets are allowed open. Because that's not going to happen until there's a vaccine widely available in the world. Now, they're saying the old distribution model of big blockbusters needs to be rethought. So they're talking about an old-fashioned release pattern, opening films overseas first, and in the U.S., opening at different times in different areas. So right now, the biggest movies are getting further away, not closer. We've talked about the movies that have been done. Studios have been loath to sacrifice billions of box office for their priciest and most popular releases. With distancing protocols and other measures, cinemas have reopened in parts of Europe, the Middle East, and South Korea, where there was a movie that was done in South Korea, Young Sang Ho's Train to Busan, an action sequel called Peninsula, did open to $13.2 million. 
And theaters did reopen this week in China with limited to 30% capacity. And remember what I told you about, you can't even have concession. No concessions. How about that? Despite the virus surge, exhibitors believe they can operate relatively safely by adhering to health officials. Now, as we know, the theaters will also require patrons to wear masks. So, yeah, it's not major movie theaters, but I see one particular movie theater that is doing curbside pickup. So you can pick up popcorn <laughs> and ices. That's pretty cool. Hey, if it works, right? At least you get something to go and have for the movies that you watch from home. I guess that's not so bad. Okay, move along. There's a few other stories to bring up. Let's go into music next. TikTok I've talked about recently here on the program. A lot about what TikTok has done in order to be able to really make a big difference for artists to get their music out there. When you realize how many songs are out there that have been made popular thanks to TikTok. If you look at the current Billboard Hot 100 chart, a number of songs have been made possible thanks to TikTok and the dances that are being done in accordance with them. So, for instance, Rockstar, the number one song in the country, it's been number one for seven weeks, What's Poppin' from Jack Harlow, uh, Blinding Lights, Savage from Megan Thee Stallion, uh, Blinding Lights The Weeknd, Savage Megan Thee Stallion, Rose of St. John, the Imanabek, I don't know, Imanabek? Iman Beck, something like that. I forget how that's the name said. Those songs are in the top 10 right now, and they are thanks to TikTok. Very popular. Streaming a lot. So there's a story from Music Business Worldwide that says that, quote, for a lot of these TikTok artists, the artists could be an avatar. It wouldn't matter. So there's an interview that Music Business Worldwide does with video. And right now, Kanye West is working with him to distribute his Jesus is Born LP coming up. In, well, he did the Jesus is Born LP from last year on Christmas Day. He's also worked with the likes of Akon, Mr. Easy, Anuel A.A., the reggaeton superstar, with over 7 billion YouTube views to, take, to date. Excuse me. So the idea is, video has a simple elevator pitch. It's like core, but for video. So the idea is, it's going to be that video helps to get music pushed out to various social media outlets and to video sources. So to get your music on, they are prominently placed on YouTube or on TikTok. So video is now working with rapper Little Pump on his independent return, spearheaded by a single called Illuminati featuring Anuel AA, which Zara already has 30 million YouTube's, uh, YouTube views in less than three months. So they understand, quote, stuff popping on TikTok and the understand artists that are huge with big bases like Lil Pump. That's why you got artists like Kanye West putting out albums through them. Now, video offers artists additional services including supply chain, rights management, social media marketing, and where applicable, a source of capital too. The reputation is for uncommonly swift upload times across streaming platforms including Spotify, Apple Music, TikTok, and YouTube. Said what Lamana says in a story is a very important trend that might be happening in music. Will the music industry, the big music stars with a following, will they feel the need to go ahead and rely on the record labels to push their product? Will the record labels be considered antiquated and obsolete? That's the question. So in Lamana's mind, is the winners of independent music distribution future will be twofold. Big global distribution giants and then smaller entities focusing on specific genres and or geographies. Often working with artists who might not earn Ariana or Justin money, but are still, relatively speaking, living the good life from their music. Which at this point, that's what all these music artists want to be able to do is make good money off what they're doing and be able to perform. Do they need to be the biggest stars in the world? Probably not. Some might, but it's hard to get to that point. And if you get so big, are you going to be able to go and keep your, you know, keep your base without selling out? Everybody feels that, right? So Lamana says there's a thriving middle market right now he's seeing of artists right now. 
Artists are exiting major label deals with an infrastructure sound around them and a significant fan base. For specific genres, including hip-hop, Latin, trap, some of the Afro-pop stuff, artists are realizing that their songs can be just as big, independent, maybe even bigger than going through the major system. Interesting. Also, to be long-term in this market, you you have to be consistently remain irrelevant. You have to consistently remain relevant. You can't just go away if you're not putting stuff out at the frequency you need to be. You could fade to the background. And with the record labels, you are stuck to a system. And through an era of music, which they call it, where you're waiting for the next album to drop. And if you don't have a good system of singles that are come out, you're going to have to continue to keep putting stuff out. Promotional singles, official singles, whatever you can do to keep the hype going for what you're doing. Artists as a whole want to be part of the community, whether that's Lookout Records and Green Day or Nirvana and Sub Pop or the rise of hip hop and Def Jam. There's always these independent labels that come aside, come alongside these communities. That's going to happen again, Lamada says, but at a much bigger scale. Ultimately, artists want to be a part of their communities and not a part of the big machines. He's also not convinced that artists are using a DIY, DIY platform also then want to sign to that platform to further their career. From a branding perspective, there's a reason why there's Lexa and there's Toyotas. Uh, Toyotas and there's Lexus. Uh, artists want to feel like that they're part of more of an exclusive club than part of an everyday platform. you got to remember that. At the end of the day, this is still the entertainment business. There's a glam aspect to it. So he also mentions how he has the conversation with managers all the time. They think of themselves as a management company, and I say, you're a label. If you're doing AR, developing the artist, making the record, making the video, that's what you are. When managers shy away from being a label, they think like, well, I don't want to do royalty payments, accounting, clearances, distribution, DSP deals. And I tell them, that's fine. That's what we do at video. Now, I mentioned Post, Post Malone's manager, Dre London, that there's a new generation of managers that don't know the rules and therefore don't abide by the rules. They have something in their brain that can be never be replaced by technology, a winning combination of business smarts and street smarts. Dre could talk to a billion-dollar CEO and a guy on the street and do business with both of them on the same day. That's never getting replaced by an algorithm. Interesting. The whole story is very extenuous. I might go and do a whole YouTube story about this alone, and I might just do that because that's a very interesting story to bring up. But again, there's a lot to be said about this story. But again, there's a couple different aspects to this story. Number one, about the fact of how the artists now have an autonomy they never had before, even though the way the music is set up, because now you're not selling by units, it's by streams. The method of making money off your music has changed, so the record labels do not have the stranglehold that they once had. And once again, digital disruption, radio, record labels, They're behind the eight ball. They must revolutionize. They must evolve if they're going to stay relevant. And at the moment, they continue to be irrelevant as every year passes. Now, here's an interesting story also that came out. TikTok and the U.S.-based National Public Music Publishers Association, the NMPA, they have now inked a multi-year licensing agreement. So all three major publishers... The world's biggest indies, the deal accounts for TikToks, past season musical works, and a forward-looking partnership. This is a big story, folks. So TikTok is going to pay the NMPA a fee for unlicensed usage of its members' works in the past. The second part, a forward-looking partnership, will give the NMPA members the ability to opt into a licensing agreement which is effective retroactively as of May 1st, 2020. Originally, the NMPA was going to sue TikTok, but hey, they decided to work together. The NMPA says, uh, according to David Israelite, the CEO of the NMPA, he says that music, quote, is an important part of apps like TikTok, which merge songs with expression and popularize new music, which also giving new, while giving new life to classic songs. This agreement respects the work of creators and gives them a way to be paid for their essential contributions to the platform. Big news. Very big news there. So appreciate that, folks. Major story right there. And good on TikTok to get that done. Again, we talked about it last week. TikTok is going to be able to keep themselves relevant. They're not going to be lost in the mix by being dropped down, which is important for them. They're going to get a chance to survive and thrive. So no banning. It could become an American-owned company. 
and they're going to be able to get this music, the, the music licensing. So TikTok will continue to keep its spot as the forefront of new music. That's huge. But now one thing I got to make mention of is that when you look at this, that means that for some of these artists, they have to keep in mind that, you know, you're going to have to work really hard to keep yourself in the mix. Because what it comes down to is TikTok, for what it's worth, they do a thing where the music is there. But I'll tell you, they have to keep in mind that for them to go ahead and stay, for music to stay relevant, the music changes so fast. Because at this moment right now, three weeks ago, you could have said that Savage, Megan Thee Stallion and Beyonce, that was a song that every girl wanted to dance to. Right now. As I record this program, and I tell you, it changes every week. Sweetie's Tap In is now the song that most girls are actually dancing to. Two weeks ago before that, it was Rockstar. And to see Rockstar for about two to three weeks, people doing the dance to it. But then, as quick as it becomes popular, it goes away. But again, it's because TikTok is giving you that first rush of a new song. But then it will eventually roll itself into music that people will actually stream on a regular basis because they'll catch the hook or catch a little bit of the chorus and say, I want to hear the rest of the song. So it will entice viewers to become listeners and they will be tempted to go ahead and catch more of what's going on, which is great. So another story I want to bring up here is a big story when it comes to a virtual event and a United Masters gentleman by the name of Steve Stout talking about the music industry and those artists that could go independent. Variety.com reports that, quote, Drake is about to get the biggest bag in the history of the music business by far. He says if Drake goes independent, the music business is done. Major words that got put out here. So at a two-day select con virtual conference, uh, Stout, who's an entrepreneur and author who has previously worked at Sony Music, Interscope, Geffen A&M, before making his own marketing agency called Translation, and a music distribution platform called United Masters. He has produced albums for Nas, Mariah Carey, Gwen Stef- he's worked with Gwen Stefani and Enrique Iglesias. He also executive produced the 8 Mile film, Eminem's feature film, the Academy Award winning soundtrack starring Eminem. Now, Stout interviewed rapper Russ under the banner Independence, a conversation with Steve Stout and Russ. During the panel, Russ laid down the blueprint blueprint of what might transpire if Drake, who signed the cash money via Universal Music Group, owned Republic Records, went independent. Quote, you think if Drake, if Drake right now, completely independent, if Drake posts a picture on the gram of his new album, Lincoln Bio, Fuck a Lincoln bio, new album out. And he was fully independent. He would make $10 million a week for fucking 60 weeks. End quote. Then Stout said, I said this before. Drake is about to come out in the next six months. Drake is about to get the biggest bag in the history of the music business by far. Both A and B, they don't want that to happen. Because the day that happens, they might as well close the business down. Russ made a point to say as Drake should go, quote, it'll fuck the whole shit up, end quote. So Russ did the math out loud in this particular event. He says, Drake uploads God's plan on a digital distributor, so whatever money it is, less than $10, right? Fine. Pay for the beat, 10K, 20K, 30K, 40K, whatever the fuck it is. And to get it mixed, four racks. So you're all $50,000 tops. That song, you owning it forever and getting paid weekly on it, you're making a million dollars a week off that song. It's different. If Drake goes independent, this whole industry gets turned upside down. That's why I'm independent. Putting out music independently. I'm a fuck this whole industry up. There you go. And Drake always has a matter to always keep himself relevant. He put a song with Future not too long ago, Life is Good, outside of an album, right? Well, he had the EP that came out. A Chicago Freestyle. So that's already been teased out there for people with an upcoming album coming up. And Drake is always, when he puts out an album bomb, when an album comes out, every song, now Juice World, you know, to his credit, rest in peace, his album came out, Legends Never Die, and I'll tell you, it blew up. Took 
over the Billboard Hot 100. A lot of good songs on there. I actually like a few of those. Come and Go is my personal favorite. It has a good alternative punk vibe to it. I actually really like that a lot. Number two song in the country, according to Billboard. But, of course, Ryan Seacrest wouldn't tell you that. Two other stories, and we're going to move along to my interview with Donnie O'Malley on the Broadcasters Podcast. i got that coming up for you, so stick around for that. RIP Cable TV from Variety.com. Why Hollywood is slowly make, killing its biggest moneymaker. As subscribers and viewers flee, media companies that once relied on cable TV are chasing streaming dollars instead. So they talk about MTV schedule, which if, I don't know if you know this, but this is really crazy. MTV has quietly morphed into almost a 24-7 offering of just one show. In late June, Ridiculousness, the Rob Deerdick show, we've all seen it. It ran for 113 hours of the network's entire 168-hour lineup. And many people were saying that MTV, which was a pioneering force in reality TV only a few years ago, that made major investments in original scripted programming have given up. Pundits had long predicted the death of broadcast TV, and while Basic Cable feasted on the dual revenue stream of subscriber fees and advertising revenue. But that gravy chain started going off the rails when the streaming services arrived. We all know this. So cord cutting has come along. Number of paid TV households peaked in 2010 at 105 million, 105 million people. Now it's down to 82.9 million. And that is actually dipping by 2023 to 72.7 million. Cables on the ropes and struggling for survival. And we're seeing brand new networks. Like I said, hey, HBO Max just came out. And same thing going for Peacock, which I personally think has some of the worst advertising and marketing ever. It feels like an old TV guide ad. You tell me if I'm wrong. While a handful of lifestyle and older skewing networks have managed to buck industry-wide declines, most general entertainment channels have suffered double-digit drops in ratings. So what they're showing is in 2019, Nick at Night is down 24%, AMC down 22%. FX down 21%, USA down 19%, TBS down 16%, TNT down 14%. So where's the future? Where are we going? The former original content president at Sci-Fi, Mark Stern, says, quote, I think where we're headed is obviously into this non on-demand, non-linear space. The decline of cable isn't a news story, which has started to take hold. Isn't a news story, excuse me. Not news, new story. But what has started to take hold is a change in narrative inside the industry. Rather than try to prop up what they all know to be a decaying linear business, cable executives are instead focusing on their still healthy intellectual properties and the brands behind them. So some of those cable brands are even aiming to carve out a space in the streaming world. FX is on Hulu. National Geographic is on Disney+. Plus. Turner team is, the whole Turner networks are on HBO Max. And so there's a lot to be said of this story. Another long story I would, watch, I would recommend you go take a listen and uh, take a read for yourself. So they're going to talk back now about MTV ridiculousness. When asked about the program's wall-to-wall scheduling, executives said they were missing the point. The linear network, network is just a single sliver of their business. MTV Fair can be found on Facebook Watch or Quibi or Pluto TV. And most recently, Viacom CBS announced a revival of Beavis and Butthead that will run on Comedy Central. So Tanya, G- Tanya Giles, general manager of Viacom CBS's Entertainment and Youth Group, says we continue to think of cable as just one piece of our ecosystem. When it comes to finding an audience for old school MTV, particularly during the pandemic, ridiculousness grew the network's frequency and time spent viewing the, it more was added to the schedule. MTV isn't the only network to rely on a steady binge of handful of repeatable shows to keep the lights on. So that's why... People are leading to wonder if cable TV has already turned into a collection of Barker networks, like those channels you find in a hotel room promoting their offerings on a loop. So ironically, during cable's height, niche channels without scripted shows, such as Food Network and HDTV, were out of favor. But now, the more specific, the better. So Food Network has seen a rating spike during coronavirus quarantines as biggest audience in years. They're in better shape than scripted. So Stern is also seeing basic cables retrenching and returning back to its 80s origins, kind of niche, fighting for audience, trying to figure out where it fits. So a lot of basic cables going back to where it started, lower cost programming, unscripted programming. So all the scripted programming we saw on cable, let's just say the best shows for the most part, for the exceptions of HBO, Showtime, and Stars, they're all moving over to streaming. 
They're all there. But, of course, that's why some of the paid TV channels have already made their way over, which is good for them. So as some of these cable companies and all these major networks are placing bets on the new over-the-top platforms, there's recent launches of Disney+, Plus, HBO Max, and Peacock. The entertainment corporations are hoping to straddle a growing precipice over the next several years, keeping one foot in the old media while placing more of their investment in the new. We're going to leave it right there in that. A lot to be said in that story, a lot of good information, a lot of interviews, very lengthy story, but take a look at it for yourself and learn about it. It's fascinating. The digital disruption and how much it has made, taken a toll is incredible. Okay, I just had one other, movie, one other uh, story I wanted to bring up before we go and move along into the interview with Donnie O'Malley. Journalism. I go to the people in the Columbia, Columbia Journalism Review. Man, I fumble around my words. A story they wrote, will changes to print outlast the pandemic? Really interesting story. So we talked about how The Guardian laid off 180 staffers, 70 in editorial positions. In Wyoming, the last true daily newspaper, the Casper Star Review, Tribune, excuse me, has now stopped printing seven days a week. No more Monday and Tuesday editions. So it could be the first time a U.S. state will publish no newspapers on Monday mornings ever. ABC News in Australia reported that News Corp's decision to end print production as a number of Australian newspapers left older readers feeling isolated and underinformed. As business models and consumer habits continue to change, journalism outlets wrestled to balance business interests, accessibility, and keeping up with a changing world and changes Choices made during a crisis will ripple into the future. Big, huge area. More media layoffs also. The number of recent layoffs by a large number of publishers like The Guardian, Vox, and BBC Signal, a second wave of media layoffs. 11,000 jobs in the media lost in the first half of 2020 on track to surpass 14,000 jobs that were lost during the 2008 economic crisis. And also broadcast ratings taking a drop, getting a big hurt as well in the story they mentioned as also as an afterthought. Broadcast ratings have now dropped in the wake of the COVID-19 panic as a loss of daily commutes limits the number of people tuning into the radio on their way to work. So broadcast radio, major plummet. In contrast, podcast ratings are looking up, though not enough to offset the significant loss of sponsorship funding. And there we go. All right, we're going to leave it there. Time to go move along to my interview that it was a really a two-part interview that's really striking. It hits a note that is strong. Truly, you hear me a couple times in this interview that I, I'm just like awestruck. I get taken back. And, you know, it was really a fascinating interview. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, I really appreciate what Donnie gave me as, as an interview on this program uh, for this hour-long interview that we did. It's quite interesting. So again, best-selling author, activist, and actor, Donnie O'Malley. Uh, by the way, he wrote the book Embarrassing Confessions of a Marine Lieutenant, Satirizing His Time of the Corps, which is available for all of you that can go look for it. We'll leave it there. Donnie O'Malley here on the Broadcasters Podcast. Here's part one of my interview with him. Enjoy. So yours truly is still recording in the middle of this coronavirus confinement as I record this. And hopefully by the time you hear this, it might be long gone and we'll be in our rear view mirror. We only can only hope. Uh, right now, I'm joined by best-selling author, activist, and actor, the founder of Irreverent Warriors, and the founder of veteran entertainment television, Vet TV, Donnie O'Malley. Donnie, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, bro. I appreciate you. Hey, my pleasure. I want to give some context, so I'm going to read a little bit here and go through this extensive background on you and the service we're going to talk about. So first of all, you're a retired Marine captain, sounds like a movie already, who spent nearly six years in the Corps, uh, thank you for your service, Semper Fi, as an infantry officer, rifle platoon commander, and fire support team leader before doing your final stint in the Marines with the Wounded Warrior Battalion at Camp Pendleton, Oceanside, California. You are the CEO and lead writer, director, and producer of the Video On Demand streaming network, Vet TV. Uh, the service has more than 50,000 subscribers at a rate of $5 a month, marketed directly to members and veterans of the armed forces, particularly the extensive web-savvy post-9-11 generation. So talk to me, uh, well, let me add, let put this point across as well. The network is, is described as this, quote, don't expect anything here to be politically correct, professional, or honorable. Don't expect us to represent the U.S. military the way the commercials want us to or the way you think we should. We made our sacrifice. We don't owe 
anyone, end quote. And in a recent interview, you said about this, quote, it really started, the idea of Vet TV started with a childhood desire to make people laugh. From that, it grew to come up with my own version of Happy Madison Productions. Expand on all that there and your whole vision of creating Vet TV. I don't remember how I came across this. If it was a book that I had read or somebody I had talked to. And the question came up, if you had to do, if you had to pick a job for the rest of your life and there was not working, wasn't an option, right? You have to work in order to live during this life. And no matter what job you do, you're going to be paid the same thing, say 60 K. And maybe that starting at 60K might not cap out at 100, right? So you have to work. No matter what you do, you're going to be paid the same. What would you choose to do? And I thought, okay, well, that's easy. I would start my own Happy Madison Productions because Adam Sandler, one of my favorite comedians, Mm -hmm. started a production company where he employed all of his friends and his family and they make comedies for a living. Like they make people laugh for a living and they make each other laugh and that's their jobs. So I was like, well, if I had the choice, that's what I would do. And so I made the decision at 19 years old, I'm going to start my version of Happy Madison Productions one day. I want to make film and television and make people laugh. And I thought at the time that I, I would achieve that goal way later in life. I had expected to first um, uh, finish college, uh, join the Marine Corps because I had to be a Marine. I wanted to go to war. And then I thought that after that, I wanted to do 10 years in the Marine Corps, um, four in the, in the regular infantry, and then I wanted to go special forces. And then I figured I'd get out after 10 years or just under, just under 10, and then I'd go back to becoming a, a teacher and a coach, which I was before I joined. So... I figured at the end of my career as a teacher and a coach, then I would start, I would pursue my dream, right? After I lived the conservative life that I was kind of raised to live, but after that, I'll go live, pursue my dream. But it all happens much sooner than planned. I never, um, I never got to pursue my special forces dream because uh, I'm just too weak. Uh, it's break too easy. So I was medically retired from the Marines. And then um, uh, I, so I said, okay, if, if I'm if I'm not going to pursue my dream of, of being in special forces, then I'm going to pursue another dream. And I have the luxury of a military retirement. So I have the luxury of pursuing my dreams. So it's like I'm also 30 years old. At, actually, not at the time, I think I was like 28, 29, some shit. Right. And, and I thought, you know what? I'm not getting any younger, <laughs> right? Like I, I'm, I'm now going to embark on this – really crazy journey of pursuing this dream of, of making film and television. So I should probably hurry the fuck up. Right. And, and that, I, I want to ask you mind. about the idea that you wanted to create that kind of environment because of how Adam Sandler's put that together. It is a click of very good, close confidants, a real entourage of people that he knows entertain it or they're good entertainers are talented they can perform so there's a lot of different projects he can do and he's been doing it for a long time and i think that's you know it's some of the best really you know amusing comedic entertaining uh content it is one of those things where you see certain groups that are kind of clicks and they work together when you have people that are in the like-minded kind of feel that can offer something different to the dance and it's not like you're just bringing people on that are just kind of being outsourced in it's, it's people that you know always says what you have with this whole audience now what i want to ask is a little bit about your background as you were in the marine corps uh any deployments and what was the extent of what you had to do when you were not on a base like where did you have to go out to so two deployments first was to southeast asia Mm-hmm. Uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Okinawa, and then right off the coast of Japan during the uh, the nuclear reactor thing in 2011. Yeah, um, we were doing humanitarian aid stuff there. And when I say we, I mean the enlisted Marines. I wasn't doing shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but but imagine if you're out there in Southeast Asia, you're thinking of apocalypse now. It's like oh, love the small napalm in the morning, all that kind of like cliche stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, I mean, we were on a ship. We didn't leave, so it was okay. more just like 
you know, when, when can we go eat food and, and lift weights? It was like food, weights, and then I read a lot of books. Okay. So that was first appointment. Um, pretty uneventful, but it was, an, it was a great time. I loved it. Then again, you could put me in a porta potty and I'll oh, I'm listen. love it. God damn, you went through boot camp. I don't give a shit about, you know, uh, not all the respect. I mean, regardless of what you had to go and do while you served, the fact you went through it, it made you a man. Like, I have a best friend of mine that went through, and honestly, he, he's grateful for the experience. And now he's working as an avionics technician. Or no, the, that's right, now he works as, he fixes the uh, MRI machines. But I have a couple of guys that went to Marine Corps, and I'll tell you, they made them, it was a great experience for them. And they, are, they they would never take it away. They're very happy with what they did. You know, in the same sense, they didn't get deployed necessarily, but, you know, it was the camaraderie. It was, it was you know, what made you, there should be more men like that in America, honestly. I think a lot of men, you know, these days you see they're a little bit uh, questionable in their manhood and their alpha male dominance. Like, well, come on now, you know, like uh, appreciate, you know, appreciate brotherhood, appreciate bravery, courage. All the things that were instilled in you as a Marine, I think that kind of philosophy is good, and not just for people that are going to watch your the watch the the, 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 the vet TV. I just think people in general that kind of mentality is great, and you know you can laugh, you can have fun. It's like a frat. It's like you can enjoy yourselves. I can appreciate that. I don't know if it's necessarily like that, but that's what I look at. That's how I perceive it on the outside looking in. Hmm. Uh. I mean, I had an amazing time. I had, it was, I mean, the Marine Corps was, um, was almost equally as fun as college. College was the most amazing time of life. Right. Marine Corps was the most amazing time of life. And, uh, and then I hope that in the next few years when Bet TV is bigger and more sustainable, um, then that becomes the most amazing time of life. Never peeping. The most amazing time is always ahead. Exactly. Let's talk about that TV itself. Now, I had to go through a little bit of work trying to get the story, get a story that I wanted to see that profiled that TV from LA Times. And of course, these bastards subscribe, you know, paywall. I got to work my way around it. And then I found it through the San Diego paper, the Union Tribune, and I found a way and I was able to do a little, a little uh, background work to go ahead and cut out the paywall on this to be able to read the story. So I got it. And they wrote this about that TV. They said, O'Malley's mini empire, quote, is based on the idea that there is a veteran market yet to be fully captured. And with veteran suicide at an epidemic rate of at least 17 a day. That's saddening. Vet TV is also built on the belief that there is good to be done in the process of capturing this specific audience. Now, Donnie, talk to me about how alongside your work with your nonprofit irreverent warriors, uh, you thought adding a TV component would work with what you're looking to do. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting how it it all played out because um, I never initially intended for any of this stuff to happen. You know, my dream wasn't to create something at 19 years old. It wasn't to create something for the military community because that's what this business is. This exists for the community. That wasn't my dream at 19. Um, but... I, um, I was really good about um, jumping at opportunities that presented themselves. And because I'm just a very engaged person uh, with whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm always thinking my, my brain is just nuts. Um, I'm always thinking of, uh, you know, I, I think that that mindset also creates opportunities. And then I see all these opportunities and I run with them. The first one was a nonprofit. I never, I, I never wanted to start a nonprofit. I, I had a goal for myself. It was to not start a nonprofit. Right. My goal was um, I want to start a company that is, um, uh, you know, that has the money to create a nonprofit and someone else could run that. Right. Um, so, all I wanted to do was really the same thing my parents, my family has done since for 50 years now, which is um, come together with laughter and love and have an amazing time together and appreciate each other. That's what my family has been doing for 50 years at our family picnic in, in Queens, New York. Wow. And so, you know, 
at, at my, that's my big, this giant Irish Catholic family in New York. And well, I don't even know. Oh, I couldn't figure that. Out. O'Malley, I could have never pegged that out, man. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's a great thing to have uh, something to look forward to. And uh, honestly, as again, it's family. And, you know, within of what you did before, you probably felt like you had family around you. Then people that you're still very close to. And the chance for you to go and give back and be philanthropic in this effort is great. Because the thing is, I can, I can hear from whatever you're saying. It's not where it's just like it's a monetization. Not at all. It's just giving back. And, you know, doing some of the things that you think for yourself, if you were consuming, you would want something like this for yourself as well in the nonprofit space and for something that you can enjoy as a medium. Uh, yeah, I think most of that <laughs> pretty solid. Pretty much. I'm just trying to peg it out. You know, not one of those people I, you know, when I do these interviews. I kind of just try to like. I try to over, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to do like hardball questions, but just overwhelmed because it's my research. I do a lot of research. And I want to ask you now about the VOD service itself. So when you looked into creating the service, you said, quote, I Googled how to start my own Netflix. That's great. And on the first page, I came across this other network called Black and Sexy TV that felt the American black experience wasn't accurately being portrayed in film and television. <clears throat> they thought BET and Tyler Perry had kind of watered down what they felt was the young black experience in America. So they created a network of shows that were supposed to be relatable for African Americans aged 20 to 40. Young and Progressive was their branding. I looked at them and they had like 12,000 people paying seven ninety nine a month. And I thought, I can think I can beat that. So from the experience, the technical obstacles, because I, I, I don't, when does it, you start Vet TV? When did you actually launch? <coughs> Well, that's weird. We launched the Kickstarter October 2016. We launched the business, as in we opened the doors, which opening the doors means we released the first episode and allowed people to start paying $5 a month. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, in July 1st, 2017. Very good. Now, the idea, so you were pretty much in lockstep with what technology was out there for KHD. You know, the streaming, obviously, you know, the type of bandwidth that people can go ahead and get their hands on and the devices they can watch your channel on or watch your service on, it's all been available. So have there, has there been anything from the experience, any of the obstacles you've encountered that you were trying to do to get this off the ground? Was there anything that you would have done different or anything that you've learned now that just uh, you wanted to do to help enhance the experience? It's really hard for me to look back and and kind of Monday morning quarterback it um, because at the time we had no idea what we were doing. And so everything that we were doing, it was like, well, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Right. Let's do it. And we did that with everything. And many of those things were not good ideas down to, I mean, I, I, I'm talking everything. Right. So, um, so I don't like, I don't know. I, I don't like looking back uh, because the reality is this has never been done before this way. Right. It's never been done with no investment, fucking bootstrapping, clawing for survival, and then actually creating this big explosive community brand. And so the fact that it was even done by a group of people who had no experience in business, none, not a single business degree in the entire company, <clears throat> up until like I want to say maybe the last six months. But I'll tell you um, that's that's uh, quite com quite accommodating. The fact that you took something that you again it was as simple as googling how do you start your own Netflix. You took the idea, took the challenge head on, tackled it, an accomplishment. I mean, it was a project. You you able you were able to accomplish this task. Your mission has been has been made, and it's out there, and it's live, and you're able to get something out that you really. That it's yours. You you help with your team. You help to create something that's 
I, I think it's very important. And I think at this time right now, as we record this program, we have, obviously have an ongoing pandemic, which, you know, I've heard it said, spread around. It is feels like it's kind of a wartime situation. I don't know if you agree with that sentiment, but obviously people are very mobilized and they're very aware of the situation. Everybody knows what's going on and we're all kind of aware, but we are trying to find ways to distract, to preoccupy ourselves so that we're not in a, in any, any way of, of being in fear of what could happen the next day. So people are obviously into streaming <laughs> content. So there are a lot of places that, uh, you know, are really getting the advantage in an unfortunate way, but you know, platforms like yours might see an actual surge in viewers. A morning consult survey they conducted on March 6th through March 9th, they said that one in 10 adults said they anticipated spending more money on movie and TV streaming services because of the coronavirus pandemic. 6% said they were likely to spend more on music for the same reason. So is there anything you've seen right now or more engagement, whether it's social media, whether it's people subscribing to the service, um, do you think there's any issues with bandwidth issues you might have to sustain growing numbers that might come as a result? Um, I can't speak to exact data. Okay. Right. So I don't want to bullshit yet. But um, our membership is still growing at <clears throat> a more rapid rate than it has been. Uh, for probably the last, uh, <clears throat> well, since the beginning of the business, actually. Right. Um, now, it was, our membership has been growing very rapidly for the last several months because we've been pouring a ton of money into marketing. Um, and But, <clears throat> so for those who listen to it, if you see the Facebook ad for, uh, for Vet TV, it's because a lot of money is going into that. Uh, but I, I, I want to say that in the last week, that growth has slowed down slightly. Um, but well, I would imagine the community that another- you're serving would probably be a little more engaged on watching the news anyway and keeping up. Some people might even consider, well, what can I do as a veteran of the, of the military? What can I do to help be involved? Because this is where, you know, I, I don't even imagine that people that you know from your own circles – prior looking to say, okay, what can I do? Can I be a part of the, one of those field hospitals that are being deployed to New York or Seattle, Washington? And they want to be more engaged and instead of sitting at home. Yeah. I mean, we have <clears throat> really uh, good hearted, active, motivated people who all want to take some sort of action. Now that I think about it, there, there is, there has been uh, an increase in engagement on social media. Um, because we've been posting a lot of content that is relevant to the coronavirus. Right. So it's topical. It's on top of mind and tongue. And so there has been more engagement there. But when it comes to the other stuff that you mentioned, I, I, it's hard for me to speak to that. I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know the data on how many of our people are volunteering uh, to go do things. But I can imagine, without having to know who they are or what you might have heard, I'd imagine that would be the kind of a mindset that would be out there. I mean, the one thing is, from all the news I've listened to, and I've tried to avoid as much as I can, and only hear certain things that I know that's probably really factual, because misinformation is, is rampant, in my own opinion. I don't trust the media so much as I used to, and I was a journalism major, and it's, it's really unfortunate that that's where we are. We can't just get five simple questions answered and asked without having opinion editorial being smeared all over it. But for me, you know, some of the comments about, oh, well, the army needs to be, you know, sent out. When are they going to get military sent out to all different 50 states? I'm like, no. I saw the reserves are being deployed. I know that there are different uh, battalions and infantries that are being deployed with their medical staffs that are going to do a great job where they need to in places of real need, real hot spots. And the one thing, too, is that, you know, it's like people are getting the mindset, you know, let's go and slow things down. Also, we need our military to be where they are overseas and abroad to make sure we are protected and secure from f- enemies, foreign and domestic. We have to still have that in place. So it is kind of tough to go ahead and say, okay, you know, when we are at a, at a time where things are somewhat normal or we'll have a new normal after this, that people are going to want to go and have the engagement. Of, of, of Obviously, you have a community here and whether they are, you know, they have your service they might they, they're watching it or they might not be at the moment because they are preoccupied. But the idea is that you have brought a community together. You have a strong, pretty well woven community that's there that's supporting what you're doing, 
regardless. And they're going to give that kind of support and that kind of leadership and that forward thinking, you know, just being out there and they're going to mobilize themselves. They're going to do what's good for the country. And that's really what the thought is, is a patriotism. Yes, it's a very special group of people who always think of giving back, even though they don't have much. Yeah, I'm so thankful for everybody that has served. Very thankful. I mean, I think one thing, too, is that, you know, the way entertainment goes, I don't think they do enough to kind of point that out. I think it gets a little bit lost. But, I mean, you know, for me, I look at military movies that are made to the box office and banked really well. And some of the stories that are told, which, you know, it tells you people, you know, they get a pre- they appreciate the military, appreciate uh, those who have worn the uniform, whichever armed services you for- serve with. So mil- movies, what I think about when I think about military movies in, in the modern area, in, in this millennium, this last decade, I think of Zero Dark Thirty, American Sniper, 1917. Those kind of movies come to mind in recent years. There was also a time where you had a lot of military comedies. So I want to ask you about the kind of content you put on the network on Vet TV. Because, you know, when I think of military comedies, I think of MASH, Gomer Pyle, Private Benjamin, Major Dad, all in the last, what, three decades, four decades or so. There hasn't mm-hmm. been much out there in lighthearted military fare. Do you feel like there's been a void for those that just don't want to watch Homeland? Uh, okay. Lighthearted military fare. Well, li- lighthearted military fare, I think that is it, it, by nature not made for the military because okay. the military experience is not lighthearted. Military experience is pretty fucking brutal, depending on your branch. Um, you know, some experiences are, are more brutal than others. But like, what is the what is the reason for the existence of the military? It's to defend the nation. And what does that mean? That means you're prepared to go toe to toe with another nation's army and fucking slaughter all of them. Your yeah. job is to slaughter in large quantities efficiently and love it. Right. That is why we exist. If you don't love that, then you're not going to be great at it. And you have to be great to win, because if you if you don't win, your nation submits to the will of another nation. So you must win. So you must be the best. So you must love it. Now, with that being said, lighthearted military comedy is something that civilians make to entertain themselves. Uh, OK, I think that they are. Maybe they think they're giving back or maybe they just think this is a cool world we want to recreate because we think it's cool. Wouldn't it be funny if we made a military comedy, you know, how did, how was stripes written? Wouldn't it be funny if these two guys did this in the military, you know, but we look at that and we're like, that's fucking stupid. That has my experience was nothing like that. So they're on the screen. They're watching this experience that is completely fake it's imaginative it's not real and nothing about what's on the screen is like is making them feel good right so they're 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 being they're being rubbed wrong every time they see something fucked up with the uniform something fucked up about the way they talk to each other they're thinking oh we don't talk like that nobody right. would say that. that a guy of that rank wouldn't do that to that guy you know like those are the things that go through our heads so immediately we're just kind of like eh. But then uh, it's not funny and nothing about it kind of makes us feel good about our military experience. And so as a result, we generally don't love watching military stuff that's made by anyone other than that TV. Now, there are exceptions. There are, there are a handful of exceptions. There's like Full Metal Jacket, Generation Kill, Band of Brothers, um, would, would say Saving Private Ryan, would like a f- would fifteen seventeen yeah, to Paris would be, be something that would be in that same realm too? There, uh, for me personally, I can't speak for everyone. Me personally, I love the realism of Saving Private Ryan. However, uh-huh. in too many instances, they took it dramatic, and they're in the church, and the guy's telling the story about how he, um, you know, when his mom used to come in to talk to him. He used to pretend like he was asleep when all his mom wanted to do was just talk to her son. And he took that opportunity away from her and he felt horrible about it. Now, why would I 
want to watch that? What about that would excite me? Why would I want to just relive this massive pain? I wouldn't. Yeah. I want to watch wow. a military battle played realistically. I want to watch guys blow up the way I've seen it in real life. I want them to keep it fucking real. And yeah. then I want to laugh hysterically. And I want to okay. laugh at the exact same shit that I used to laugh at in combat. Because minutes after a dude fucking blows up, we're making jokes. Right, right, right. And some might say, oh, no, you know, it's not appropriate for you to, 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 to make jokes about that. And it's like, not appropriate. <laughs> Who the fuck are you to tell a guy in combat what's a, an appropriate way to deal with watching someone blow up? Who you know, are you? Donnie, you're, I, 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 you know what? I'm not going to understand it. You're absolutely right. And I feel kind of stupid because I really, you know, when I put that question there, I was just thinking of the fact that, you know, they put all the, I mean, there is all this content that's been out there that's beforehand, but the truth is that's what vet TV is supposed to be. It's supposed to be for veterans, by veterans, for veterans. You're really putting out content. So the stereotype um, it's unfortunate, but I've been stuck with that stereotype because I thought that would be like, you know, you know, it, it feels really stupid now when I think about it because you you've made it clear. Why would anybody want to look at it like that? So you're given to give that real experience, and I mean, I, that's one thing why I think people are going to should take a look at what Vet TV is because then you see from the real perspective. That I think is very important because obviously people are interested in the content. There's a reason why people want to watch World War II in color or watch History Channel or, you know, catch all these movies that are coming out. There's all these stories that want to be told. And the fact of the matter is that you're doing it for a perspective for the people that were, that can relate the most and understand this more than anybody else. Yes. And I appreciate that. Is there anything out there that you think that even resembles what is the real experience? I mean, Full Metal Jacket, you said before, and you mentioned yeah. others. I'm just wondering, is there anything of the current sense right now that really gives that same sense? Because for me, I always felt like Homeland was very realistic in my eyes, the way they put that together. Uh, I can't speak to Homeland. I never saw it. Okay. Well, you've been yeah, working, working on your own contest, so I can imagine if you've been doing that for a while, but, you know. That they were probably just, you know, that really gives me a different mindset. Like if I had to think of the programming, you can't just be any everyday programmer and do this. You, that's yeah. why you have to do this yourself. Cause nobody else, mm -hmm. if you brought somebody else from the outside and said, Oh, we'll just make another, uh, we'll make another mash. We can do, well, mm -hmm. we're going to like that. No. Exactly. Like Ron Howard just tried to do. <laughs> right. And that's what, what, that's, if somebody else were brought into off on the outside, that's exactly what they would do. And that's completely against what really this should be. It's not just not that it couldn't be, but it's this is what it should be, what Vet TV is supposed to be. Yeah. But then again, yeah. when it is Vet TV and I see the entertainment side, it is something to be said about where entertainment, it's a it, that word has a different, a little bit slight definition change, I would imagine. Was that right? Uh, yes. So, so for us, um, uh, I, I actually, I just kind of thought, no, I didn't think of this. I read this recently, but we kind of classify as community filmmakers, right? We are creating film for a specific community of people. It is made in conjunction with them. They tell us what they want to see. They make sure that the script is, um, is, is authentic. Um, they are on our sets as advisors making sure that the sets look authentic. Wow. And um, our directors know what is authentic. So, you know, we, we are speaking to this community and um, it's, it's a different time. It's a whole different style. It's like, just let me just give an example. So we're finally, for the first time now, we're working with people who have been professional screenwriters for many years uh -huh. And we're contracting them, um, the writing of some of our shows, in conjunction with one of our people. So um, for a couple of these screenwriters, you know, they hand us some stuff, some outlines uh, of the project. And we're reading it. And we're like, no, that wouldn't happen. This guy would never do this. He wouldn't talk like that. That sounds cheesy. 
Yeah. This is something, 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 something. And these are guys who have been screenwriting for 20 years. They just, know how to fucking write screenplays. Right, right. And we've only been doing, we're, we are all professional screenwriters. However, we've only been doing this for a couple of years. So now, ha, why is it that this guy, who's a much better writer than all of us, is submitting stuff to us where we're just like, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. It's because the traditional screenwriting process for fiction doesn't yeah. value authenticity the way that TV values authenticity. Okay, that's going to leave it for this week. We'll come back with more of Donnie O'Malley next week here on the program. Stay tuned for that. And as always, until next week, remember content is king and the control of your content is in your hands. Thank you for listening to the Broadcasters Podcast, presented by BroadcastersPodcast.com and KingofPodcasts.com. The Broadcasters Podcast is brought to you by KingofPodcasts.com slash Amazon. If Amazon is good enough for the King of Podcasts, it most certainly is good for you. KingofPodcasts.com slash Amazon. And don't forget to check out the King of Podcasts wrestling program. The Wrestling is Real Podcast, exclusively at KingofPodcasts.com.